Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Astor. I'm Director of Marketing for South Pole. I'm very excited that you have joined us today on our webinar about clean fuel standards, what they are and how to engage. Uh, I'm excited to be joined today with Dave Siemens. He's our Senior Regional Manager for our clean fuel programs uh, at South Pole. And uh, he's also joined by Luke Sherman, who's one of our managing consultants of climate policy, finance, and carbon markets. Uh, Dave and Luke will have a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, we've got about an hour with you today. Um, by now, you guys know the drill with webinars. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to ask him at any time using the question uh, box, which should be appearing on your screen in GoToWebinar. We'll get to those questions in about 45 minutes or so. Uh, if we need to go a little bit extra time, I'm sure our panelists will be happy to do that. Uh, and this webinar will also be recorded. So if you do have colleagues uh, or folks you'd like to share it with or come back later to check some notes, um, we will send a follow-up email afterwards to give you access to that recording. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and we will get rolling. Thank you, Nick. All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Clean Fuel Standards, what they are and how to engage. This webinar will help attendees gain an understanding of these markets while highlighting one of the newest programs, Washington State, and also discuss how South Pole's expertise makes for a great partnership in these markets. With that, uh, before we get started, as Nick has mentioned, there's just a few housekeeping items that I'll just review again. Just uh, first and foremost, microphones have been muted during the presentation. As Nick mentioned, there is that question and answer function, uh, and we will try to answer questions at the end of the presentation, which should take about 45 minutes. With that, I will turn over to our agenda. Uh, our agenda today includes four different elements. First and foremost, a quick introduction to South Pole and your presenters, a discussion of clean fuel standards and what they are, then a deeper dive into Washington's market, and finally, South Pole services and solutions in this space. So with that, I'll move on to the introduction. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Luke Sherman, who is a managing consultant in South Pole's Climate Policy, Finance, and Carbon Markets Group. He has broad expertise in regulatory policy, carbon markets and pricing, as well as low carbon fuels, which is the topic of today's discussion. I'm Dave Siemens, the Senior Regional Manager for Clean Fuel Programs in North America, and I also sit in the Climate Policy, Finance and Carbon Markets team with Luke. I've been in consulting for most of my career focused on decarbonization and air quality projects in the transportation, power generation, utility, as well as oil and gas sectors. Over that time, I've investigated and tested numerous low carbon fuels and technologies, including some of the first hybrid genset locomotives, as well as hydrogen and high thane urban buses. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce South Pole and our mission. At South Pole, we work with businesses and governments across the globe to help realize deep decarbonization pathways based on a thorough understanding of climate risks and opportunities as well as the highest emission reduction standards. To realize this mission, we have a passionate team of experts made up of engineers, scientists, and advisors from around the world. Over South Pole's 18 year history, they have always had one shared belief that our economy and society can only thrive if businesses can embed sustainability and the environment into the heart of all of their activities. Before we get into clean fuel programs, I'd like to ask attendees to please complete a quick poll, which will help us get to know the audience and guide the conversation. So Nick, hopefully you can start the poll and folks can just answer this poll and we'll come back as soon as we get some answers. All right. Well, it seems like we have a number of one, two, threes and fours. That's great to see. Um, you know, that shows that people have some understanding of these markets, but uh, looking to get some more information, which is great, and it's exactly why we're here today. So with that, we will keep rolling. All right, now we can move on to the presentation, starting with the core elements of clean fuel standards. And with that, I will hand it over to Luke. 
Thanks, Dave, and welcome everyone to today's web webinar. Really looking forward to walking you through some of the key details of clean fuel standards before providing more information about the particular low carbon fuel standard uh, that was recently launched in Washington state at the beginning of January 2023, as well as some of the opportunities that clean fuel programs more broadly, as well as the one in particular in Washington, provides to a variety of fuel uh, providers and suppliers um, and distributors. Um, if you could proceed to the next slide, Dave. So I, I see from the results of that poll that was just conducted that some folks are maybe not super familiar with what clean fuel standards are. So really looking forward to giving you that brief background knowledge um, before delving into some of the more specificities of Washington State's uh, clean fuel program. So in short, clean fuel standards are market-based policies designed to provide incentives for the production and uptake of low carbon fuels. By requiring fuel producers and suppliers to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of the transportation fuels they provide to the market, clean fuel standards reduce greenhouse gas emissions and stimulate economic development and the production of low carbon fuels in uh, the jurisdictions that are imposing them. So in general, clean fuel programs are launched by governments with the intention to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of the transportation fuel supply um, in pursuit of broader jurisdictional greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. But they also have a variety of additional incentives and ancillary objectives. And these can be to diversify the transportation fuel supply available to the market to render the market less vulnerable to shocks in um, supplies of various fuels. And they also provide opportunities to attract private finance in um, the production of lower carbon fuels um, and farms, for example. So in short, they work in the fashion of a jurisdiction proposing a reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of the fuels being used in the jurisdiction imposing them with the greenhouse gas emissions intensity taking the form of most frequently of a carbon intensity score or carbon uh, CI. And these CI scores are the total greenhouse gas emissions produced over a particular fuel's life cycle from well to wheel. So all the way from its extraction or harvesting in the form, in the case of a lower carbon fuel, um, all the way through the refining, processing of the fuel, transportation and distribution to an end consumer and final combustion in an engine. Uh, this jurisdiction imposing a low carbon fuel standard sets a declining target for a carbon intensity score for the companies that are uh, regulated by the standard. There are two main actors in low carbon fuel standards. Um, these are credit generators and deficit generators. And credit generators are transportation fuel suppliers and producers that are producing fuels to the market that have a carbon intensity below the baseline set by the jurisdiction imposing the, uh, the program. Whereas deficit generators are those that are providing conventional petroleum based fuels and are required to achieve compliance with the program by purchasing credits from those that have generated credits via the supply of lower carbon alternatives. Um, there are a variety of ways in which a clean fuel standard can be um, complied with, one of them being the purchase and retirement of credits used by credit, uh, excuse me, by deficit generators. But alternative means of compliance include the blending of lower carbon fuels into uh, the transportation fuel supply, for example. And um, there are a variety of exciting ways in which uh, all their market participants can get involved in low carbon fuel standards that we look forward to walking you through in, in a few minutes. If you could progress to the following slide, Dave. So as I, as I mentioned, clean fuel standards um, are largely um, engaged with by two buckets of actors, with the first one being those that are referred to as deficit generators. So as I mentioned, these are producers and importers of transportation fuels that derive from conventional petroleum based sources, most typically. Um, so these are, you know, suppliers and producers of diesel and gasoline. 
And these entities have to purchase credits from credit generators to achieve compliance with the program because these fuels have a carbon intensity score above the baseline set by the jurisdiction imposing the clean fuel standards. Credit generators, on the other hand, are those entities uh, providing transportation fuels to the market with a CI score uh, below the baseline imposed by the government. Um, so examples of these entities that would be uh, generating credits as a result of their activities include blenders of biomass-based fuels, um, providers of green hydrogen uh, for use in the transportation market, as well as, in some cases, um, utilities and other actors that are deploying electric vehicle charging stations since that facilitates the uptake of zero emission vehicles in the market. There is another role for credit aggregators to play in the facilitation of the transaction of the credits needed uh, to comply with the clean fuel standard um, and generated by those credit generators on the right hand side of the screen. And these actors provide a means by which deficit generators can secure the credits they need to comply with the program and credit generators can find buyers for the credits that they are generating. And while th there are a variety of actors that can serve in this function and South Pole is, is one of them. If you could progress to the following slide. So to provide a bit of context about the um, development of clean fuel standards across the US and Canada. The first jurisdiction to impose a clean fuel program in the region, referred to as a low carbon fuel standard in that jurisdiction, but having the same key details, was California, which uh, did so a little bit more than a decade ago and has, as a result, displaced uh, millions of gallons of petroleum based transportation fuels from its market. And this program has been quite successful in ensuring that the transportation sector in that state reduces uh, the intensity, greenhouse gas emissions intensity of uh, the fuel consumed in that state and led to a number of other jurisdictions across the US and Canada to mirror um, it California by launching their own low carbon fuel standards. So we've seen in recent years, low carbon fuel standards emerge in British Columbia, in Canada, as well as in Oregon, just to the north of California. And most recently in 2023, uh, similar programs emerged in Washington state and uh, at the federal level in Canada. So it will no longer be the case that British Columbia, British Columbia and transportation fuel suppliers and producers will be the only Canadian entities subject to a, such a program. These programs have also been evaluated for potential launch and implementation in a variety of other jurisdictions across America. So we've highlighted in uh, light gray some of these that uh, are considering uh, developing and launching their own clean fuel programs. So these include um, states from a variety of political leanings as well as economic structures from New York to Minnesota to New Mexico and Illinois. And uh, it's against this backdrop that um, we see a, a really healthy low carbon fuel supply market emerge for the purpose of supplying some of these programs. If you could progress to the following slide, please. So we'd like to use Washington State's clean fuel standard as an example of how these markets function, what their objectives are, and some of the you know, background context for which jurisdictions are implementing clean fuel standards in the first place. So with that, um, we can proceed to the following slide. So it's important to step back and understand why jurisdictions across America and Canada have been imposing low carbon fuel standards in the first place and use Washington state as an example uh, in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions profile. Over the past decade, uh, especially jurisdictions in the United States have made incredible progress in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions associated with their uh, electricity sector as a result of uh, declines in coal-fired power production, as well as um, rapid declines in the cost, the levelized cost of electricity of solar and wind-based sources of power. 
And as a result, in many jurisdictions, the electricity sector is no longer the uh, biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in many states and at the national level in the United States as well. But the transportation sector has faced has been a bit more stubborn in terms of the decarbonization journey and as a result has attracted increasing attention from policymakers for uh, policies that can drive down its greenhouse gas emissions profile and one of the reasons why the transportation sector has you know faced challenges in its decarbonization is because even though uh, vehicles have achieved fuel economy imp efficiency improvements the number of miles or kilometers that uh, Americans and Canadians are driving has increased over the past few decades and the population has grown and these and thus the number of drivers and these have offset some of the efficiency improvements that we've seen in automobiles over the past uh, 30 years 30 plus years and as a result policymakers have been looking to other policies that can cost effectively drive down the greenhouse gas emissions footprint of the transportation sector which in washington state's case makes up almost 40 percent of the state's greenhouse gas emissions We've seen, um, as, a res as you can see in this slide here, Washington State's emissions um, you know, rise over the course of the 1990s and really not a decline quickly enough to meet the jurisdiction's long-term emission reduction goals, which have been put in place for the 2030, uh, 2040, and 2050 milestones. So, for example, in 1990, which is used as the benchmark for those future greenhouse gas emission reduction goals that I'll describe in greater detail in a moment, the state's uh, greenhouse gas emissions total was 93.5 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And while in 2019, the greenhouse gas emissions level was discharged that year in the state was below its 1999 peak, it was still uh, about 10% higher than its 1990 level. And this poses a number of challenges to state policymakers who have put in place uh, very ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction goals over the next three decades. So by 2030, the jurisdiction aims to achieve nearly a 50% reduction relative to that 1990 level. By 2040, a 70% reduction relative to that 1990 level. And by 99, by, excuse me, by 2050, a 95% reduction relative to that 1990 level and the achievement of net zero greenhouse gas emissions. So what that would mean is all those remaining 5% of um, greenhouse gases discharged into the atmosphere in that state would be offset um, by either technical or natural uh, activities. So recognizing the challenges and the great need to accelerate the decarbonization of the state's economy, state lawmakers and the governor imposed a variety of policies to really bend the greenhouse gas emissions curve. And some of these include a deadline by which all uh, power in the state has to derive from zero carbon sources, stricter regulations on the emission of hydrofluorocarbons, which are very potent greenhouse gas emissions often embedded in refrigerants, and the promulgation of two additional market-based policies, one of which we're discussing today, which is the Clean Fuel Standard, and that program launched on January 1st, 2023. This is the same date on which the state's cap and invest program, which is a emissions trading system that regulates the state's largest greenhouse gas emission polluters, but is a separate program and has a variety of different compliance actors um, and provides a variety of opportunities to different market participants or potential market participants. If you could progress to the following slide, Dave. So with more in terms of the key details of Washington State's clean fuel standard that are important for folks to be aware of, the objective of the program is to reduce the carbon intensity of covered transportation fuels by 20% below 2017 levels by 2034. And this clean fuel standards principal objective is to reduce the overall carbon intensity per gallon of fuel use in the sector. 
The graph on the right hand slide shows the uh, trajectory of the proposed uh, carbon intensity reduction and the mandated carbon intensity reduction over the course of the next uh, 10 years and since its launch in 2023. So you can see that uh, upon the program's launch, um, the a carbon intensity baseline was selected and every year uh, with a short exception between 2030 uh, and 2033, a, uh, this, the target declines at a predetermined uh, factor. And the providers of transportation fuels to the market have to ensure that the fuels that they are supplying the market either have a carbon intensity at or below that baseline, or they have to purchase credits from credit generators um, who are provided with the incentive of supplying these fuels since they have monetization opportunities as a result. The law applies to transportation fuels that are sold, supplied, or offered for sale in Washington state in quantities greater than 360,000 gallons. And um, examples of the types of fuels that are provided uh, in this market are, as I mentioned, gasoline and diesel, biomass-based fuels, electricity and hydrogen. Um, and my colleague Dave will provide more details about the actual fuels that are subject to the program scope. If you could progress to the following slide, Dave. So here we wanted to provide some information about what Washington State's clean fuel standard, um, you know, reduction looks like in comparison to the two other American jurisdictions that have imposed clean fuel programs as well. So these being California and Oregon. So because um, California and Oregon uh, launched their clean fuel standards several years ahead of Washington State, they've been able to achieve uh, re faster reductions or earlier reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of the transportation fuels consumed within their borders. And as a result, Washington State has some catching up to do. And you can see as a result in the early 2030s, there's quite a steep reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions intensity permitted of transportation fuels. Um, and it's important to note as well that the other jurisdictions highlighted here, California and Oregon, are considering further ratcheting up the ambition of their clean fuel standards. And this is uh, the result of the program able to achieve compliance at a relatively low cost to transportation fuel producers and consumers, and as a result of the uh, recognized need on the part of policymakers in those other jurisdictions to really accelerate the transportation fuel, uh, transportation sectors, greenhouse gas emission uh, reductions to align with broader net zero goals. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dave to walk you through some of the opportunities by which uh, participants in these markets have for actually generating credits in this market. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate it. Uh, well, just a quick recap. So thus far, we've talked about clean fuel standards, what they are and what are involved with these markets. We've uh, taken a little bit deeper dive into the Washington market and a few of the particulars about that market. And I'd like to go a little bit deeper talking about fuel pathways. Well, in each of these markets, they have specific fuel pathways for their individual fuels. And these uh, fuel pathways um, describe the different stages of a fuel's life. Uh, as Luke has mentioned, the life cycle of a fuel is from well to wheels, which starts when the fuel or the feedstock is um, produced, and then it is uh, followed all the way through to the end of its life when that fuel is being dispensed into a vehicle for that vehicle's operation. Um, the fuel pathways also have another use, which also helps to determine the carbon intensity score, which, which Luke has mentioned earlier. Um, that fuel pathway decides all of the different stages that are part of that life cycle. And each of those stages have energy use and emissions associated with them that need to be understood and calculated to give you your final CI score. Um, to do that, we rely on life cycle assessment tools, such as the GREET model. The GREET model stands for Greenhouse Gases Regulated Emissions and Energy Use in Transportation and is originally a model developed by Argonne National Laboratory 
But in the case of clean fuel programs such as Washington have been manipulated and adjusted to be more state specific. So in Washington, we have the WA GREET model, California, the CA GREET model, and in Oregon, we have the OR GREET model. In addition to the very complex GREET model, there are also what we call tier one calculators. And these are much simplified versions of the GREET model to help calculate emissions for well understood fuel pathways. And these fuel pathways include renewable natural gas, renewable diesel, as well as ethanol. And these calculators are much easier to work with than the GREET model. They have a lot less manipulation required to get your results. And so if you have one of those well understood fuels, you are not required to use that GREET model, but these tier one calculators. Next, I'd like to give a brief example of what a life cycle would look like. In this sense, uh, it is a petroleum fuel such as gasoline or diesel fuel. And this would be the, the, fuel, um, the fuel pathway that would be taken uh, to calculate that carbon intensity score. So in the top left-hand box, you see crude oil would be pumped out of the ground, extracted, and then it would be transported. So either via rail or via truck, it would be transported to that refinery where it is processed and uh, you know, transformed into that final fuel before then being transported to its final location. So to that refueling station where a, fuel, uh, a vehicle stops and refuels up, uh, which uses the fuel for its operation. Now, during each of these different stages, uh, greenhouse gases are emitted and energy is being used. And so each of those get input into that life cycle assessment to come up with the final carbon intensity score associated with that fuel uh, pathway. Now, when we talk about fuels in, in Washington, uh, Luke mentioned it a little bit earlier, but this slide provides all of the different fuels that are um, approved in the Washington Clean Fuel Standard. These uh, fuels are pretty much the same as all of the other markets, um, and so they're, they're generally uh, in line with each other as far as what fuels are approved and, and allowed under these, um, these markets. So these can be broken down into three different buckets. We have the regulated fossil fuels, we have the regulated alternative fuels, and then we have the optional or opt-in fuels. And you'll notice that they're color-coded. We have two different colors here. We have the dark blue, which represents your fossil fuels, so your gasoline, diesel, your liquefied and compressed natural gas, as well as your liquefied petroleum gases. Under your alternative fuels, you have your ethanol, your, your hydrogen, and your biomass-based diesel. And then under your optional or opt-in fuels, you have your electricity, as well as sustainable aviation fuel, and bio-liquefied natural gas, and bio-CNG. And the green represents lower carbon fuels or the potential for low carbon fuels, which is fully dependent on what feedstocks you would be using, as well as the processes that would be taken to make these fuels. I would also like to note that two fuels on here, hydrogen and electricity, have multiple different incentives under these programs. Not only can you generate credits for, for uh, producing green hydrogen or clean electricity, but as Luke mentioned earlier, there are other incentives in these markets. So as an example, if you were a fleet and you were purchasing fuel cell electric vehicles or electric vehicles, you can receive credits associated with uh, the installation and use of hydrogen or DC fast charger infrastructure. So they have what's called capacity-based credit, credits associated with those. Um, and in addition to that, when the fleet uses that hydrogen fuel to, to fuel up the vehicles or the electricity to charge those vehicles, you can also incur additional credits associated with that dispensing of the fuel because in essence, you are displacing gasoline and diesel fuel use in, in turn for hydrogen or electricity, which has a much lower carbon intensity. This next slide, um, provides a, an overview and ex, um, comparison of the Washington Clean Fuel Standard to a few other markets, which uh, Luke briefly touched upon. So we have the California, British Columbia, and Oregon Clean Fuel Programs. 
uh, with California being the oldest as well as the largest of the three markets. Um, and this slide provides some key market details coming directly from each of the jurisdictions based on transactional data that is reported to them. Um, and we've tried to summarize some of the key statistics here. So looking at California's LCFS program, they've transacted over $22 billion in credit volume since 2013, with an average monthly transaction volume of almost $300 million. Um, looking at uh, those transaction reports by the end of November 2023, uh, California, California's market had an average credit price of about $70. And when we uh, adjust for inflation, looking at the start of 2013, all the way through the end of that November 2023, we see that that price has increased almost 140% since the beginning of its operation. Um, similarly, British Columbia has seen a pretty significant increase in its pre credit price as well, almost 130%. And as of the end of that November 2023, we, we see a price in U.S. dollars of about $366. Now, Oregon is a little, a little bit smaller market, but still a significant amount of credit volume transacted with uh, about $815 million since 2016. Average monthly transactions of almost $10 million. And as of the end of December 2023, a price of about $138. Again, adjusting for inflation, we see a price increase of about 80%, which is significant. Um, compared to these three markets, Washington is, is very new. Uh, as, as Luke mentioned, this program started in 2023. Um, so not a significant amount of volume thus far, about 12 and a half million. And average uh, transactions of only about 4 million per month. At the end of 2023, about $74 uh, as an average credit price. Um, and because it just started in 2023, we did not try to calculate the uh, price uh, since start because it is volatile and we'd like to get, we'd like to see some more transactions taking place before we really do that calculation. Um, one thing to note here is that these are based on the transactional data that was provided to each of the jurisdictions and does not fully represent what we're seeing in the spot market currently. So spot market prices for each of these different markets is potentially lower uh, than what you're seeing here. And that is due in part to, to what Luke had mentioned earlier, and that these markets are going through jurisdictional changes and regulatory changes associated with their programs to either, in California's case, increase the, um, the carbon intensity reductions associated or in the case of Washington to align more closely with these other markets by adding third party verification, as well as some other requirements um, that will just strengthen their market over time. The next few slides are gonna get into how South Pole can help in these markets. Um, and we're gonna start by looking at a retrospective look, a uh, look backward at deficit generators and how they would actually operate in these markets. So you'll notice that there's a couple numbers at the top and then there's a line down below. So if we start up at the top at number one, a deficit generator would start by registering in Washington's system called the Washington Fuels Reporting System or WFRS for short. And they would start reporting their fuel on a quarterly basis to the Department of Ecology. Now, currently, Department of Ecology would review that data for accuracy, completeness, and certify the, the fuel being reported to calculate either deficits or credits. But in this case, there are deficits associated with that fuel supply. And under number five, that user must procure credits to offset that deficit um, that has been calculated. So we follow that line downward and we look at the purchase line. So you see that credit credit generators would offer for sale those credits, the deficit generator would buy those credits, and then that deficit generator would retire those credits um, to meet their compliance obligation. And then you see the dotted line down below, they would just continue on a quarterly basing, basis, uh, you know, continually doing this process of reporting their fuel, calculating either a deficit or, or a credit, and then either meeting that, that deficit with credits or, um, 
you know, we'll get into those credit generators in a second. Um, along this entire process, South Pole can, can help. We can help with the registration and the um, discussions with Department of Ecology, the registering of applications and certifications of pathways, as well as when you get down to the purchase line, when you're when you're looking to purchase those credits, um, we can also assist in that aspect, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So let's look at credit generators. Um, so this slide should look very similar to the last one, except we have a few different steps. Um, so the first step in this stage would be registration in that WFRS, but because it is a credit generator, there's also another system that must be used, which is called the Alternative Fuel Portal or AFP. Then just like the DEFS generator, the credit generator would report their fuel quarterly, the DOE would review it, and then in this case would uh, issue credits associated with that fuel supply. Now here's where the credit generator has a decision to make. There are a couple different things you can do with that, that credit that you've generated. You can either bank that credit for future use, which as you can see on the slide, they do not expire. They have no expiration date. So if you were trying to hedge uh, you know, credit prices and expect to see a credit price increase in the future, you could bank those credits until that credit price increases and then sell them at that time. Or you are fully uh, welcome to sell those credits as soon as they're generated to those deficit generators who would buy them. The deficit generator would retire those credits and then both the deficit and generator um, would document those credit sales to the DOE. Now, as I mentioned, this, this is the current way that things operate with the DOE uh, reviewing quarterly data and uh, certifying it for credits or deficits. But as I mentioned, they're going through proceedings right now where they are looking to use third party um, verifiers to actually perform these uh, calculations and certifications uh, to assist the Department of Ecology since they're, uh, they've got their hands full with a lot of different applications. And this is also more consistent with California, Oregon, and British Columbia, which have been using third party verifiers since the beginning of their programs. This next slide gives an overview of South Pole's offerings in this clean fuel uh, program space. And it's been broken down into four distinct offerings. So we have market advisory, we have timely reporting and compliance, we have credit activities, as well as decarbonization solutions. So looking at the first bucket, market advisory, for example, we can provide clean fuel market intelligence, as well as technical economic advice on market strategy, uh, and we are constantly monitoring these different markets to understand what the, the political and uh, regulatory um, changes that are happening and how those may influence the markets. So we can assist with um, anything related to those markets and advising on uh, the different technical and economic situations in each. Secondly, we have timely reporting and compliance, which we briefly touched upon in the last two slides but we can help with carbon intensity determinations, pathway certifications, program reporting and compliance, basically anything related to program operation um, that a client may need. The third bucket is credit activities. Uh, so South Pole can assist with management and transfer of credits on behalf of clients as an aggregator, as Luke has mentioned previously. Um, this would be leveraging our adept in-house carbon procurements team's expertise. Um, and, um, you know, we just, we have a lot of expertise in this area in the, in the voluntary space, and we would like to continue to use that as we move further into compliance, uh, such as these clean fuel standards. All right, the last uh, bucket is decarbonization solutions. And this is focused around one single question. So how can we improve our fuel's carbon intensity? So South Pole's diverse team of technical experts can help investigate new technology trends, process improvements, or market instruments such as renewable energy credits or RECs for short to optimize fuel pathway intensity. Um, you know, this, this can ensure maximum credit generation potential while also anticipating those future CI benchmark declines. 
Um, you know, decarbonization solutions is a very broad term. And uh, in this sense, it's really something to discuss between the client and South Pole, how we can really help. Um, you know, we, we've got, as I mentioned, extensive experience in this space, and uh, it's going to be very much tailor made to what the client needs as far as, you know, those decarbonization solutions or innovative technologies that might help their business to improve that carbon intensity or just the process in general. So with that, that concludes our presentation. Um, and at this time, we'd like to ask uh, questions or, you know, go through questions and answers. Thanks a lot, Dave, and thanks to Luke as well. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that have come in, so we'll just go through them as they as they arrived. Uh, if you do have additional questions, there should be a little box with a question mark in it on your screen. Just click it. A like a sidebar will open and uh, ask your questions away, and we'll get to them um, as soon as we can uh, over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. All right, question number one. Uh, could be for either of you. Uh, can credits be transferred between different markets? That's a great question. The answer is no. Um, these markets are on their own. So if you are supplying fuel to Washington, you can only generate credits in Washington and those credits can only be used in Washington. Similarly, California and Oregon, they are very separated markets. So if you want to join the California market, you can't then take those credits and move them to the Washington market. Perfect. Uh, next question. Uh, is it predicted that Washington state will be able to achieve its goal of 45% below 1990 levels by 2030? Will they get there? In your opinion, I guess. That, that is a great question, but I see, Luke, you wanted to jump in so I think that's a fantastic question and something that a lot of observers of Washington State's climate policies are looking at quite closely and it is certainly the result of the yawning gap between its uh, 2030 goal and its you know, most recent year for which greenhouse gas emissions inventory was calculated that prompted state legislators to impose you know a suite of economy-wide carbon pricing and low carbon fuel standard for the transportation sector and other targeted policies to really ensure and facilitate the achievement of Washington State's goals. But of course, there are a variety of factors outside of Washington State's uh, lawmakers' control that will determine whether or not that reduction target is achieved. But um, the state really has put in place very aggressive um, deep decarbonization policies to uh, really give it a, a very good chance of doing so. Um, and so we'll have to see um, what happens over the next coming years, but I think the commitment to de decarbonization in the state is quite robust. And, and I'll just tap, tap onto that too. Um, you know, looking at some of these mature markets like California, you, you see that they've been very successful up until now. And they're actually at a point now where they're trying to, to decide how they can make their decarbonization goals more aggressive to make to make sure that they can maintain you know these markets uh, and the the credit values associated with these markets. So I think using California as an example, I think if Washington can follow that model, um, I believe that at least in the carbon intensity, they, they're going to see significant reductions over the next ten years. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next question uh, related to the first question on transferring credits between markets. Uh, what about fuel producers? Can fuel producers join more than one market? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, fuel producers can join one or all of these different markets. Um, it should be noted that each of these markets has their own programmatic conditions and requirements, uh, different LCA models. Uh, some of them use different LCA models than others. So there's a lot of different uh, aspects that you really need to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, if someone really wanted to get into multiple different markets, that's really a strategy to look at. And obviously something that South Pole can help with and help, you know, discern some of those complexities. Got it. Uh, question on uh, RIN pricing. Uh, any insights and outlook for pricing over the course of 2024? Uh, 
Well, um, so that is in the context of the renewable fuel standard. Um, so those are uh, RINs or renewable identification numbers. Um, and so I predict that the, the RINs program uh, will continue to be strong, especially when you're talking about cellulosic biofuels, um, renewable diesel. Um, I can, uh, we've seen significant value associated with those, those RINs up to date. And I, I foresee that that's going to continue. Um, you know, I think right now we're seeing more and more uptake of renewable natural gas, renewable diesel, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon, especially with sustainable aviation fuel now being, you know, more in the purview. Um, it's, it's really, I think it's really important to have that RFS program. And I just, I foresee that popularity to increase in those credit prices to main, maintain stable or even increase over time. I think as well, the renewable fuel standard is an interesting market and policy to mention in the context of low carbon fuel standards and to highlight as well the key differences between the federal and renewable fuel standard and state level low carbon fuel standards in the sense that the primary objective of renewable fuel standards is to achieve a particular share of the transportation fuel supply that derives from non petroleum based sources, um, whereas the primary objective of low carbon fuel standard is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of a the transportation fuel supply to the market and low carbon fuel standards as a result are technology neutral performance based standards so even uh, conventional producers of gasoline and diesel can demonstrate a, a reduction in the carbon intensity of the fuels they provide if they're accompanying their uh, refining or production processes with um, carbon capture and storage, for example. And the renewable fuel standard really differs from those low carbon fuel standards that we see on the West Coast of the United States and in British Columbia and now in Canada federally, in the sense that it is not technology neutral. It does have preferences and requirements for particular fuels. Um, so there really are distinctions in the markets and the different um, monetization opportunities presented to fuel providers as a result, I think, stemming from that difference in the objective, ultimately, of the programs. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, market question. Uh, why would I want to join Washington over other markets? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think that that really would take a much broader strategy to look at what uh, you're trying to accomplish, um, you know, where where you see offtake of your fuel taking place, um, as well as is really looking at, um, you know, credit prices and where we see those credit prices going. So it's 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 more than, I think, one simple yes or no answer or even just a quick, uh, you know, response. I think it it would take a much broader you know, strategy, but I think in general, um, you know, we're seeing credit prices anywhere from about $60 all the way, you know, when it first started to about $100, which is pretty significant. Um, and so if you look at, you know, those credit, credit price increases in those three markets that we, we looked at earlier, we're seeing significant increases in those prices. So if you start generating credits in Washington earlier, you know, you may be able to, to hedge and uh, see significant increases in those credit prices and you know obviously monetization of those credits so i think that's the best i can do right now but i don't know if luke if you want to add on to that at all no, no, I, okay i agree with what you with your analysis <laughs> all right um how about uh next, next question here um do you know if washington state uh has considered how to balance the demand for renewable feedstocks that are currently flowing more into sustainable aviation fuel and away from biodiesel. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think that really speaks to the regulatory design of the program. Um, you, I think Washington did a pretty good job of taking the existing markets and really making it their own, um, looking at their individual priorities. Um, and I, I think the regulatory changes that are coming into Washington may address this a little bit. Um, but 
I don't know I have, if I have a full answer off the top of my head. Um, that may be a question that we might have to take offline and, and get back to the to the person who asked it. Um, but Luke, I want to give you the chance to answer if, if you have anything you want to share. Thanks, Dave. I would say that decarbonizing the aviation sector is a very important objective of not only Washington state lawmakers, but of lawmakers in other jurisdictions that have imposed low carbon fuel standards or clean fuel programs or clean fuel standards, as they are sometimes referred to among one of those many names. And as a result, uh, program administrators and um, lawmakers have, in some cases, allowed sustainable aviation fuel to be an opt-in fuel that can generate, uh, you know, participate in the market consequently. But in general, in many markets, uh, the um, low carbon fuel standards apply strictly to on-road transportation sector and not to um, the other sectors that use transportation fuels, such as aviation. Um, is a concept, you know, is, is frequently the case. All right, coming up next. Uh, funny, this is one of the first questions I asked you, Dave, when we first started having this conversation. I was just starting to learn it. So I think it's a simple answer. Uh, does actual physical renewable fuel need to be transferred to, in this case, they say California, but presumably Washington or, or Oregon, uh, in order to be eligible to generate credits? Yes, yes, that's... Um... That is a great question and a very important one. Um, so in the case of many of the biofuels, you have to physically transport that fuel into the market. So if you want to get into the California LCFS, that fuel has to be transported and sold within the California market. Um, there are a few uh, ex exemptions to that, and that uh, would be electricity as well as your um, uh, renewable natural gas. So renewable natural gas can use what's called a book and claim method, which means the renewable attributes of that fuel can be disconnected from the physical fuel. And so you can inject that renewable fuel into a pipeline. As long as that pipeline is interconnected throughout you know, the, the US, which it is, uh, you can inject that biofuel into one location and then physically pull fuel out of that uh, in a different location, but those renewable attributes can be sold to an off-taker in these specific markets to generate credits. Similarly for electricity, you have to be in the same region generally as uh, you know where you wanna sell this electricity, but it does not have to be specifically when it, within California or Washington or Oregon. It could be within that, that region and just transported and delivered to that market. Good. Um, question on 45B, maybe you can explain what that is first, um, but down the road, could that be uh, stacked is the word, um, or uh, could, you, could you use that to your advantage uh, with regards to um, credits, fuel, clean fuel credits? Yes. Um, so 45V came out of the IRA, so the Inflation Reduction Act, and it is a, it is a, um, it is a tax incentive for hydrogen production. So if you're producing clean hydrogen, they have uh, a tiered incentive system associated with that hydrogen production. Um, you know, there's some stipulations, obviously you need to be in the US, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, requirements for the electricity that you use and the hydrogen that you produce, but ultimately you can generate, uh, you know, tax incentives associated with that fuel production. Um, I believe at one time you were allowed to stack those credits. Um, I think it still remains to be seen if that's gonna be allowed uh, in the final determination. Um, but that is a great question because when you're looking at these fuels, you wanna see how many things you can stack on top of each other. You know, the renewable, the renewable identification numbers or RINs, the LCFS program, as well as the different tax incentives associated. Um, that hydrogen is one of them. And I believe uh, they're still determining if you are allowed to stack that. Um, and that is something that we're that we're watching as well to understand if that's going to be a possibility. But um, again, that would be part of a broad strategy to understand, you know, how how we um, how we want to play in these different markets. What are the incentives that we can we can stack on top of each other? And what is the ultimate amount of revenue that you can make with a specific biofuel or or electricity or hydrogen. 
We got time for probably one more. I have a question of my own. That's a real basic question. Uh, if we don't have any other that pop in, um, California, Oregon, Washington, what's next? Any any rumblings in terms of the U.S. Uh, of other states getting getting involved uh, in the near future? Oh uh, yes. Um, well, Luke shared that that nice map and, and some of those locations. But um, actually, I think yesterday, I think it was announced that New Jersey has uh, put forth legislation for uh, a clean fuel program in their mar in you know in their state. So that's one of the latest ones that we've seen. But um, other than that, I think uh, you know as as we've shared in that map, New York, uh, Illinois, New Mexico. There's a number of states that are investigating it or have investigated it investigated it so um i think there's there's a number of ones on the on the horizon i would echo exactly the jurisdictions that dave mentioned i think it's also important if we want to kind of look into our crystal balls and see which states are most likely to be the next ones to impose these low carbon fuel standards is to first determine which states are you know very have very aggressive greenhouse gas emission reduction goals and as a result, are likely to look at policies like low carbon fuel standards in order to ensure that the transportation sector decarbonizes in line with those broader goals. And I think as well, we could look at the states that have you know, thriving agricultural economies and you know, not a very significant um, indigenous fossil fuel resources because they would be potentially interested in keeping some of those dollars that are spent on fuels within their economies and as opposed to purchasing fuels from other states or jurisdictions um, that they're not generating themselves. Um, the last question is go New Jersey. Um, guys, this is great. I think we're just right on time to, uh, to, to wrap it up. Uh, as I mentioned, we did record the, se the uh, session. You'll get an email uh, with a link to that recording. Do feel free to share it with colleagues. Uh, can we put the contact information up? Do you guys have the, uh, the, the just so the people can write that down? Uh, feel free to drop Dave or Luke a line. That's Dave's contact uh, information. Uh, we're certainly eager to hear from you uh, and eager to help you with your a deeper understanding of this uh, this uh, issue as well as uh, other issues on what we call your climate journey here at South Pole. Um, a thank you to Dave and Luke, a thank you to you all who showed up, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time.